Welcome to The Lover's Hole, where we're rereading the Aubrey Matron novels of our favorite author, Patrick O'Brien. You're with Mike. And Ian. And we are making our way through 13 Gun Salute. Ian, can you catch us up to where we've been and where we're headed? Mike, I'd love to. We are in Pulau Prabang, in what we now call Indonesia. Stephen last week had moved into a bawdy house and was working closely with the local naturalist Van Buren and with banker Wu Han to gather intelligence whilst expressing a strong desire, a very strong desire, to see an orangutan. Meanwhile, the resplendent English and rain-drenched French missions to the Sultan had had their first audience with the Sultan. Stephen had discovered a connection between Ledward, who, as we know, is a renegade Englishman on the French side, and the Sultan's beautiful assistant, Abdul. Mm. That's where we were last week. This week, Mike, we've got all kinds of colours, all kinds of spectacle. We've got a colourful birthday celebration for a British princess as the crew show off the firepower of the Diane. We've got Abdul making a spectacle of himself, becoming an even bigger problem. Stephen discovers an intelligent setback and takes some corrective action before he heads off. He leaves during a break in the negotiations on an amazing journey. Mike, what we might call a journey to the heart of Patrick O'Brien. Oh, yeah. We've talked about how this is just one of the most memorable chapters, yeah. I think, for some of us. Yeah, well done. Well done. Well, we, we open... A little inauspiciously, with Stephen kind of running into Van Buren and asking the Malay name for uh, various chemicals. Yes. And Van Buren's yeah. saying, Well, you know, I haven't heard about some of these. And, you know, can you tell me about their therapeutic value? And, and Stephen explains, No, 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 they're, they're not about medicine. He needs them to create firework colors in a cannon display for this princess's birthday, that the sultan's going to be visiting the ship. And they really want to, you know, kind of impress him here. So Van Buren sends Stephen off to the islands, as he describes it, best Chinese cracker maker. So Ian, just when we thought perhaps the earlier, you know, all these references to earlier in the canon were done. We got, we've got another one, right? Does this remind us of anything? Well, just when we thought we'd had the last of the references to the earlier books, here we've got what you might say, the very, uh, very poor pun this, Mike. This is a flashback. To the Ionian mission. Do you smoke it? Do you smoke uh, it? <laughs> I smoke it indeed. Well, Stephen asks Van Buren for a little more than just directions to where he can get fireworks. Um, he, he's still on the trail of more intelligence about what's going on in the Sultan's court and how the French are positioned. He asks Van Buren if the Sultan is a pederast, if he's a gay man. And Van Buren says the Sultan is, and he's currently completely besotted with this young man, Abdul. Now, Stephen tells Van Buren that one of Wuhan's men had brought their significant debtor, a guy called Les Hueur, who is the Pondicherry clerk who works for Duplessis, the French uh, chef de mission, to see Stephen in the night. And this looks initially like it's a bit of a spy coup here, because in exchange for a good word with the East India Company for his family's import-export business, in exchange for English protection, in exchange for some money... This guy, Les Sueur, in the French camp is going to offer to provide Stephen with information from inside the French camp, including rough drafts of Duplessis' journal. Now, Van Buren's very happy to pass this along. Van Buren is really glad as well to read in one of these rough drafts that Van Buren's contact with Stephen is viewed so far as purely scientific. Stephen had persuaded Fox not to come to see Van Buren about the Buddhist monastery precisely in order... To, to maintain that veil of respectability, to not compromise the position that Stephen has here in the, in the country. As they're setting all this up and feeling good about the fact that they've got this connection now via this guy, unless you were, Stephen realizes that he's late for an appointment with Jack, and we all know what that means, and he heads off in a great hurry. And Mike, there's a really interesting little little side note about the cast of characters. Lesueur was also the name for André Lesueur, who was the spy master on the French side, based in Malta, m many books ago, back in Treason's Harbour. This also seems, and you and I have a kind of had a quick look through the canon text searching, there have been a few other references. We counted at least three other references, including this one, to people named Lesueur. And it seems like Lesueur is one of Patrick O'Brien's go-to French surnames and we dug a little bit more and 
there's a French naturalist and painter named Charles Alexandre Lesueur who lived in the early 19th century. So naturalist, painter, Mike, maybe it's not a coincidence that this guy's surname Lesueur is also one of Patrick O'Brien's favourite surnames for secondary characters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great spot. Well, we know that Stephen was late and and sure enough, you know, Jack and Killick and Bonded, who'd been waiting for Stephen at his money changer Ling's house, uh, had given up after about 11 minutes. And, you know, they've headed off after getting stores for the night's reception. You know, Stephen finally joins up with them and, and they all pointedly look at their watches. <laughs> they tried to tell him off here. And then Killick and Bonded head back for the ship with some of these supplies. Jack and Stephen head to the firework makers. Now, as they're walking past the French mission on the way there, they see Ledward and Ray walking arm in arm towards them, about 100 yards off. Ray spots them, panics, runs across the street, leaps a gutter, and disappears into a clothing shop. Ledward continues on. You know, O'Brien says his face is set and tense, and, and Ledward deviates slightly to go around them, but kind of, you know, just plows through here. And Stephen notes that, likewise, Jack does not, change his expression, O'Brien writes, there's only a remote gravity about Jack as he passes Ledward here. It's interesting, isn't it? A couple of times now, the, the main interaction that we've had with Ledward and Ray is them viewing Stephen with suspicion and horror and fear. And uh, yeah, something's building. Something's building for Ray and Ledward. Maybe something's building for Stephen. We'll have to see what it could be. So, off they go to pick up these coloured gunpowder chemicals, the things that they're going to lead this great firework display. And afterwards, Stephen asks Jack what he thinks of Ledwood and Ray. Jack answers, only disgust. And in answer to Stephen's next question, says, on reflection, no, I would not kick Ledwood. <laughs> and Mike, f- first of all, I was a little bit uh, set back by this. Is he expressing disgust at these two characters being homosexual? And I, I'm sure... After a moment's reflection, that's not what he's disgusted about. He's disgusted right. to, to be encountering these two people who've had such a big impact on the service and on Stephen and on Stephen and Diana in particular through the whole Laura Fielding affair. Right. So and, and on Jack himself with the whole, you and know, with the, it, and with the stock exchange trial. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Me. So on reflection, he would not kick Ledwood. And may, maybe we're implying there that there's some more grave punishment than kicking awaiting Ledwood. <laughs> As they walk past the tree where Stephen had spoken with Lesueur the night before, Stephen says if he had a white stone, he'd use it to mark this day, a day when he's brought off what he describes as a useful stroke in my own line. And he's talking here about his spy abilities in r- rootling out and turning this source, Lesueur, in the camp. M- Mike, any kind of spy hubris this early in the chapter makes me just sit up and pay attention here. Right. Um, so Stephen's feeling very pleased about this deal with Lesueur. Jack, in his in his own mind, casting around thinking, well, I can't see any white stone, says, well, never mind. Let's go back to the ship. I have a case of Hermitage and we're going to get stuck into the wine this afternoon. Yeah, and, and it, they do. You know, it's it's afternoon, it's warm, they've drunk a lot of wine, <laughs> and then Stephen heads off to kind of talk to the gunner, Mr. White, and, and he's trying to tell him about the use of these chemicals, but, but actually he's spending most of his time convincing him that these colored chemicals will not harm his guns. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's, it's great fun here, you know. These, the gunner is convinced that these strange chemicals, as he keeps saying, these Chinese chemicals will either honeycomb or burst his cannons. And Stephen tells him the story about Jack, you know, using these successfully, as we alluded to earlier. Yeah, that, uh, you know, Jack had bought this fireworks maker who had gone out of business, excess inventory, and used that powder on an early journey very successfully here. Yeah, I, a, a different story, but the same endpoint as we had back in uh, in. Ionian mission as well. Right. Well, the gunner and his mates are very worried, but the rest of the crew is delighted to have something to do besides, you know, kind of standing around on the ship, lying at anchor. And they have been working tirelessly to have the ship completely ready for the Sultan's visit. And they're done far ahead of time. It says they prepared four elegant lofty targets trimmed with bunting on staves as long as the carpenter could spare. 
And now they're all chipping round shot. They, you know, they really want to make this great gun demonstration with assault and go off with perfection here. Uh, Fox, in the meantime, is practicing shooting with his rifle, and he has his other rifle there next to him, hoping that Matron will show up so he can, you know, whip him once more in the shooting competition. <laughs> Well, th- this is all sounding okay, and I like the fact that they are now able to take their ease a little bit. In fact, for for everyone except Fox, th- this is great. They're they're ready before the appointed time. They're expecting the Sultan to arrive late because they all know that's what Orientals and foreigners do, with the, with the prejudice of the British sailor. sailor. Um, and I love this very idyllic line in the text here, Mike. They settled down to enjoy the indefinite waiting in the calm luxury of doing nothing in their best clothes and enjoying the breeze that now blew across the anchorage. Ah, sounds very idyllic. Now, they don't get to relish this for very long because guess what? They get taken by surprise. The Sultan's large proa heads out and it's 40 minutes early. Fox, who was the one who had not yet changed, rushes away to shift his togs. Fielding goes to check in on Stephen and Jack says, if some awkward sod had wanted the court to catch us with our breeches down, he could not have advised them better. But the Navy is always ready, steady boy, steady, and the awkward sod is going to be disappointed this time, I think, Mike. So the Sultan, his vizier, his deputy, his chief of staff, and many of his council are received in naval splendour. There are roaring guns, there are howling pipes, and everyone, including Fox and the old buggers, is in perfect setup at the reception. They take drinks under an awning, and the Sultan, who's particularly interested, takes his tour of the ship. He understands the explanation that Jack gives him chalking out on the deck whenever Fox's Malay wasn't good enough for a, a nautical explanation. And again, we've had this before. Visiting dignitaries are really hot for the gunfire. The Sultan and his vizier are no different. They're really interested in the great guns, and Jack offers a demonstration. Uh, Mike, this all sounds like it's going to be straightforward, but we have a bit of a cast of characters on board. Yeah, we do. Yeah. There's there's one kind of pebble in our shoe on what is otherwise <laughs> this great hike here. You know, they return to the quarter deck. Everything's been going well, except Abdul's behavior. Abdul's been rude. He insulted Killick. He's he's you know insulting the Dianes and, and Ali and Ahmed. And, and, you know, O'Brien describes him as parading around with petulant wantonness. You know, uh, he had almost pulled the lanyard on one of the quarterdeck guns until the Sultan himself stopped him here. And then Abdul insists on shooting one of Fox's guns, one of these rifles that Fox had set aside there. He completely ignores Fox's instruction about how to hold it. And he, you know, he tells Fox that he's the best shot on the island after the Sultan. But then having ignored all this, you know, he doesn't cradle it right. He fires it. The gun kicks back, injures his cheek and his shoulder in the recoil. And, and you know, the Sultan is trying to calm Abdul's tears of pain and mortification, O'Brien writes. Uh, and, and the Sultan's making very strong hints to Fox to give Abdul this gun, this, you know, great shooting piece of Fox's to help, you know, console him here. Um, yes. Now, it, you know, this is all going on, and I think everybody is really happy all of a sudden to hear this pipe of all hands to make sail, you know, to turn the attention away from, as O'Brien writes, this nasty little scene. So it's funny. I, I, I saw all hands make sail the first time I read this. I thought, oh, so they're done. So they're leaving them behind. But no, no, of course, what they're doing is sailing out to a little way offshore so they can do the gunnery demonstration. The targets that they've set up before with the bunting, they're towed away to the north and the south of the ship, two of them to starboard, two of them to larboard. The Diane gathers way quickly, and the gun teams, the hand-picked gun teams, are assembling at their pieces. The forward guns of the main battery are going to fire simultaneous broadsides, an all-or-nothing affair, as we hear it. And th- This is doable because... The Diane's a well-found frigate. This is not always the case that you can get away with uh, with one simultaneous broadside. Of course, it's Barrett Bonden who's laying the first gun. He lines it up, fielding cries fire. The target leaps in the air, and a few shots then land beyond it. Sultan's absolutely delighted with this gunnery. He's pounding his left fist in his right hand. The vizier's eyes are sparkling. The guns reload. This time, there are no visible misses. And Mike, th- 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 this is great... Happy afternoon for Jack. Happy afternoon for the Sultan and the Vizier. Fortunately, we don't hear how Abdul is thinking right now. 
But we're not done yet. The order sounds and it's time for hands about ship. The Diane tax stays in just over her own length and everyone runs back to their guns and they destroy the final two targets with a deliberate certainty. And 12 minutes after they'd first slipped their mooring, they arrive back at the Sultan's Proa. That's quite quite the 12 minutes out and back and four broadsides. Fox tells Jack and Fielding that the exercise was most impressive and that the Sultan says he's seen nothing to equal it. So great result. Really just what they were hoping for. Jack and the Sultan bow and smile and Jack asks Fox to tell the Sultan that in a few minutes he hopes to show him something that goes beyond it at least in terms of loyalty. And Mike, they've landed this word loyalty here. He, he wants to make a point that loyalty is both important to the people of the British mission and it's something that we Brits might be a little bit better at. They're hinting that this is potentially a, a, a bit of a chance to throw some shade at the French who might have exhibited some disloyalty. Anyway, we ter- it turns out that this next display is going to be a salute-fired in honour of Princess Sophia's birthday. And Mike, we, we had, had a little dig about this. I, I remember reading the name Sophia and I thought, oh, I wonder if it's just Jack, you know, promoting in his own mind his bride um, Sophie to be Princess Sophia. But no, there was a real Princess Sophia. She was one of the daughters, the the lifelong spinster unmarried daughters of King George III, uh, Princess Sophia of the United Kingdom. Her birthday, it turns out, was in November. So that fits as well. Nice. Well, as as darkness sets in, it's it's one bell into the last dog watch. The gunner, Mr. White, comes out in his best uniform and, and the crew and the Marines are all at attention or as O'Brien writes, something faintly resembling it. Yeah. And he sets off the first nine pounder and it sends out, as O'Brien writes, a vast tongue of crimson and a strangely shrill explosion. And the Sultan cries, oh, you know, it kind of in spite of himself. Now, White goes down the line and he keeps repeating to himself, if I wasn't a gunner, I wouldn't be here. Boom. Next shot. If I wasn't a gunner, I wouldn't be here. Next shot. And so I'm going to I'm going to come back to you on this because I was thinking, I know he's really afraid of this powder, but this seems like unusual uh, behavior. You know, well, you know, maybe enlighten us a little bit. Yeah, glad to. It's a traditional gunner's kind of timing rhyme. It's a bit like one Mississippi to Mississippi. In in the days of the Navy before you had, you know, digital wristwatches and uh, timepieces generally, this was a way for a gunner to time the even distribution of shot in a salute. So it's like, if I wasn't a gunner, I wouldn't be here. So it's kind of a four second bang. Mm-hmm. If I wasn't a gunner, I wouldn't be here. Bang. So that's what he's doing. He's timing. Nice. Well, and, and for here, I love it how O'Brien, you know, it's got this double meaning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wait for one of these things to go off when I touch the you know, uh, shot to it. Well, you know, so one by one, they're going off. One shoots sapphire blue and the whole court now is exclaiming. And then a brilliant white, a rosy pink, an uncommon violet and so on down the line until there's this final deafening mixture of three different powders in the last discharge here. It's great. And I'm sure Jack would have been thinking, oh, this happened to me by accident in the Ionian mission. It'd be great to pull it off here where I can do it, you know, for my own purposes and for my own devices. And uh, I'm sure there's a, an, an inward smile for Jack Aubrey at this point. Oh, yeah. He's definitely wowed them here. Right. Yeah, definitely. So they're done. Uh, this has gone really well. And Stephen heads to Van Buren's. And, and as he's you know about to come in, he steps over this large python by the garden gate now Stephen tells van buren about it he says it's 25 feet long you know van buren asked him what kind it was and Stephen said well there wasn't enough light or time to examine its labial scales to determine whether it was in fact particular <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah it, it was dark and i'm not gonna pick this guy up right now yeah, no and van buren says oh yeah i see him occasionally he's never proved objectionable but you know, he suggests that, you know, they shouldn't be standing under his tree <laughs> just, just in case. Like, whoa. Yeah. Right. Well, he also tells Stephen that the, the tapir that they were uh, dissecting, that he's now left the bones from that dissection with the small red ants so that they'll clean off all the flesh before they send these bones to Cuvier in France here. Hmm. This there's quite a lot of uh, death and forebode. I mean, even more than Stephen 
often has, you know, dissecting specimens and stuff. This idea of the dead tapir and you know, stripping its bones with predatory ants and all of these references to, you know, the python, a silent predator that might just kind of crush you unwittingly. All kinds of signals of bad things going to happen for someone, maybe in the human world. Makes me wonder, Mike. I wonder who in the human world is threatened by all this potential death and deconstruction here. Right. Stephen says that the negotiations which had started well have become more difficult, despite the help that they've got from Van Buren and Wandar, despite this inside line that they've got with Les were, despite the fact that Stephen's managed to somehow win the goodwill of the vizier and the greater part of the council, especially the relatives of the sultan's wife. Fox is making progress, and the sultan inexplicably vetoes further conversations with the British mission on various pretexts, and Stephen and Fox are convinced that Abdul is the problem. We remember at the end of the last chapter, there had been this significant glance across the dining table between Ledward and Abdul. Van Buren wonders to himself what interest Abdul could possibly have in the matter, and Stephen says, well, I'm pretty sure. He's basing himself on the scenes at the feast and I guess other things as well. He says, I'm pretty sure that Abdul is Ledward's lover. And Van Buren says, well, in that case, Abdul is playing with fire. The Sultan's wife is a very determined woman, comes from a very powerful family. She really hates Abdul. The Sultan is very jealous. This doesn't sound great. Right. Well, Stephen now thinks that Ledward has led Abdul to believe that the French are going to throw their frigate in as part of the bargain, you know, along with the guns and the subsidy and the shipwrights. Yeah. And, and you know, Stephen says that's the last thing they have to offer. Ledward has actually lost the last of their money gambling. Yeah. And, and Stephen learned this when he discovered Duplessis' rough drafts, the rough drafts that he'd been receiving I have actually been falsified by Ledward to deceive the English. You know, it turns out that, you know, he'd been getting these rough drafts. He's thinking, you know, gosh, this is just way too easy. And then we remember that Van Buren had said his gardener's half-brother worked in the house. Well, Stephen had talked to the half-brother, and the half-brother had brought all of this trash over from Duplessis' house to Stephen. Well, Stephen has now gone through it, and in this trash, he found the actual rough draft notes for some of the days that he had, and he could compare the two and realize that there was an original set and then a set meant for Stephen here. This Pondicherry clerk, you know, Ledward had had him playing Stephen along here. So now Stephen knows that for some reason they're trying to get me to believe that they're throwing this, you know, ship in. And I, and I think therefore Ledward is, is getting Abdul to believe this. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's it's interesting that it, all in a day's work, in one chapter, in what is a relatively spy intensive book, we we almost without comment we've gone from we've got this guy less you are we've got some dirt on him he's going to work for us all the way through to ah it turns out that he's been doubled and he's actually working for the opposition, and now that we've got on the inside of that again Stephen's back in control he's like a little George Smiley operation going on here I think I think George Smiley would be pretty proud about this. And we discover that then there's that there's been this connection between Wuhan and Xiaoyan and the mission and the, the threat to this guy's mercantile house, to Lesueur's family's mercantile house, because he doesn't have safe passage, unlike the other members of the French mission. So having managed to convince Lesueur that this is all under threat unless he plays along, blackmail him in other words, they've got him back on the inside. And Lesueur has now continued to deliver both, that is to say, the drafts, of these dispatches that are meant to deceive Stephen and also the actual trash so that they can see both what is being transmitted to Stephen and what is actually going on. And this seems like actually a, a worthwhile thing to continue. So sounds risky, but Stephen's handling all this with, with great confidence. He now knows what the French have actually done and what they want him to think that they've done, like this offer of the frigate. Van Buren wonders how the French will benefit if Stephen thinks this. Now, Stephen's not sure. It, it, it is a bit of a puzzle. How, how will the French benefit from trailing their strength of their negotiation position to Stephen? And Stephen thinks maybe it's there to discourage Fox. Maybe it's to have another route for the Sultan and his people hear it from someone in the English mission to give it more credibility. But Stephen is pretty sure that Ledward has convinced Abdul of it. 
now. This is pr pretty deep double dealing that we get all condensed into a couple of paragraphs here. We have to stop and slow down as readers and pick the bones out of it. But just like O'Brien, pretty quickly, the scene is switched. And it's switched when Mrs. Van Buren comes and joins Van Buren and Stephen here. Yeah, yeah. So we've gone from now a double to a triple agent. And then <laughs> Mrs. Van Buren, who, you know, who O'Brien tells us is elegant, slim, intelligent, and above all, cheerful. You know, and I, I just love that. And she announces, my dear, supper is on the table. And, and so I, I'm just going to read from the text there. Supper, cried Van Buren, amazed. Yes, my dear, we have it every evening at this time, you know. <laughs> yeah, come, it will be getting cold. And I, I just love this. I, I love it in its own right, even if it just existed by itself with Mrs. Van Buren's humor. And then, then this distracted response from Van Buren, you know, this delighted response here. And I love this echo back to the first chapter in Master and Commander when Jack asked Stephen to dinner. Dinner, cried Stephen, as though the meal had just been invented. Dinner, oh yes, charmed, delighted. <laughs> so I just thought, yeah, here we are, another, you know, this residence back with the cat in here. Well done. And it, it, it's a nice little touch as well that she's not just Mrs. Van Buren, she's Mifrau Van Buren. This little, it, it, I, like you, Mike, I think when I first read that, I thought oh, maybe that's her first name, but it's it's short for, for my, my, my lady, in other words, in Dutch. Right. So Mevrouw van Buren means Mrs. or Mrs. Or, or, or Madame van Buren. Anyway, despite the little dig in the ribs here from Mevrouw van Buren, we do get to sit down and they do get to eat dinner. Over dinner, van Buren tells Stephen about the post that he's received, about the journals that he's received. And he includes a reference to somebody who he describes as that charlatan Klopf who vapors away about his vital principle. I'm like, we talked an episode or two ago about the vital principle, this idea that you know, life requires some unknown force to keep kind of body and soul from separating from each other. And that dysfunction of this is, is the cause of disease. O'Brien's bringing it back up again in passing. But Klopf, do we think that's a real character or is that another fictional one? Well, I, everything we can tell from from the Patrick O'Brien Muster book and from a lot of searching, it's a fictional one. This is Klopf is not a guy you know associated with the vitalism at the time, but it certainly you know O'Brien is using this to keep bringing this theme to keep this theme alive here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's going to be important, I think, for a few more chapters to come as well. Huh? Anyhow. Van Buren says that he's very sorry to hear about this turmoil in London and the run on the banks. And as readers, we're going, wait, wait, hold on. Oh, yeah, I remember there was we've had rumors dropped in, I think, three or four times already about these run on the banks. And I'm sitting here with my ears perking up going, are we going to find out now if this is real or if this is just noise in the background? And we're not going to find out, <laughs> um, at least not for sure. Van Buren hopes that Stephen's not suffered any kind of consequences from the collapse of these banks. And he responds in a very Stephen, very phlegmatic way. He says, bless you, I have no money. And then he remembers that he actually has a great deal of money. And he goes on to say, that is to say, for many years, my life was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and it would have been short if I had not continued to live. So poverty and solitude became quite habitual, the natural state. I think of myself as penniless. Yet now, in fact, the case is altered. I have been blessed with an inheritance, which is, I may add, looked after by a banking house of unquestioned integrity. And what is much more to the point, I am no longer solitary. I have a wife. And by the time I return, I hope to have a daughter too. Oh, and, and it's, it's a really bittersweet combination of, it's, it's lovely to get another check in on what's been going so well for Stephen in his life in the last couple of books. But I can't help thinking, Mike, as he dangles this idea of, oh, my bank is beyond reproach, that perhaps there's a bit of a hostage to fortune here. Perhaps there's something being planted for us. But by the way, this 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 is something that O'Brien can't resist from time to time. Not the first time and certainly not the last that he's picked up this quote from Thomas Hobbes about life being uh, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. That's Thomas Hobbes describing the condition of humans, uh, the state of human life um, in a country that's perennially at war. So it's a statement about wartime yeah this this whole you know we just had kind of a running set of topics and as you mentioned kind of at the beginning we had you know with the python and the ants here yeah. and and now we've talked about vitalism this you know what separates the living from the not living 
you know, a, another kind of note of real jeopardy, this run on the banks and Stephen's refusal to believe that it might impact him. But because we know, you know, he supposedly moved his money on Jack's advice, which Jack is now sorry that he gave. And then in, in the midst of all that, Stephen brings his wife and his daughter into the conversation. You know, maybe this is kind of, you know, Stephen's vitalism, if Jack's vitalism is the Navy, you know, yeah. Stephen, uh, Diana, you know, and, you know, with all this thing and then brutish, nasty, you know, poor, it's like, wow, there's a lot going on here. And, and like you, I'm, I'm just tensing up a little bit here. Oh, yes. Anyhow, we're still a little ways off knowing really what's happening with the banking story. So meanwhile, we get to go back to the family story. They all drink to Mrs. Maturin and her soon-to-be baby. Mrs. Van Buren tells them that the Sultan's wife herself is two months pregnant. And the Sultan is making a pilgrimage to Biliong. Stick a pin in that. Making a pilgrimage to Biliong to ensure that it's a boy. He promises to gild the mosque there if it's a boy. He's going to make the the dome of the mosque, gold-plated. When he learns that the pilgrimage is going to take eight to nine days and that almost the entire council is going with the sultan and therefore pausing the negotiations, Stephen happily announces that he's going to go to Kumai. Now, Mike, we'll we'll come to Kumai in a minute, but do we know anything about Biliong? Well, Biliong, you know, it's not on canonade.net. It appears like Pula Prabang to be a fictional place. You know, I couldn't find it related to the temple or a pilgrimage site or anything else. But interestingly, it's the name for a very specific kind of Malaysian axe, which is the head of the axe is um, attached to it in a way that it can be turned. So it can be used for, you know, really nice carving and then turned a different way, used as a pretty uh, effective and deadly weapon. Huh. So, huh. you know, kind of, again, this fascinating art, life and death, you know, beauty. Uh, it's, it's, again, another. And here now, as a reference to, you know, the, 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 where the, the pilgrimage that the sultan is taken. So this, again, this journey between life and death that we're on here. Fascinating. Wow. wow. So, Mike, we're, we're getting into a really, really exciting sequence of, uh, of steps on this journey now for Stephen. Um, first of all, he's got to get himself ready. He goes back to the boardy house, decides that he's going to ask Fox. And he's really, really hoping I hear that Fox, I think here that Fox can't make it. But he thinks it's only polite to do so, to ask Fox to join him on the visit to this Buddhist monastery at Kumai. In the entrance hall of the boardy house, he sees the young midshipmen, Reed and Harper, who have been sent ashore under Fox's watch while women are allowed on the Diana. And this is, as it turns out, a fairly fruitless effort to protect their morals because despite not being exposed to what goes on below decks with women aboard one of Her Majesty's ships, they're sitting in this brothel <laughs> with middle-aged women smoking and drinking, watching a lascivious dance. And Stephen writes his note to Fox, returns to the entrance hall and walks over to their table and this is another chance for somebody to see Dr. Maturin and pull a bit of a face in a rather different context, though. Reed blushes and Harper turns pale and pitches forward. And which of us hasn't been in that state in a brothel in the middle of the day, eh? I mean, <laughs> we've all been there. Anyhow, Stephen catches poor old Harper, tells him to take this note to His Excellency immediately, and meanwhile asks the man in charge of the brothel to have Reed carried to Fox's residence without delay. Fox, it turns out, thank heavens, can't go with Stephen since the Sultan has asked him to join his pilgrimage. And that's going to make up, the Sultan thinks, for the time that the Sultan spent with Ledwood earlier on in the hunt. Fox replies to say that he very much hopes that Stephen can join him and Jack for breakfast. So Fox can tell Stephen some things that he would appreciate drawings and measurements of from the Kumai temple. So there's a little little alliance of orientalist interest growing here between fox and stephen right 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 well at at this breakfast you know uh jack comes in he greets stephen at breakfast and then he excuses himself to go off and he has to flog reed and harper you know this he's got to administer the punishment for their behavior on shore as he's gone stephen tells fox that this invitation to you know join the sultan's pilgrimage it's, it's a real diplomatic coup because you know, Fox is very upset about not being able to go to Kumai here. Yeah, um, yeah. Now, 
as they're talking about this, Stephen's asking, you know, is Abdul going to go along with you? And and Fox says, no, 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 no. You know, pilgrimages have these very strict rules, you know, of chastity. So, you know, Abdul will certainly not be on the trip. And as they're talking, Jack comes back in and uh, he, he makes reference to, you know, uh, as, he, as he comes back in, he says, you know, enter the righteous Sadducee. And, and I, I don't know whether we come back to that one or not, but... He and then, having said, you know, enter the righteous Sadducee. He says, you know, there's there's a real problem with flogging boys. It's it's balancing being too hard and maiming them for life, and being too soft and and not really hurting them at all. Now he says that you know he has trouble with this. He's he worries about this balance getting this right. He said, but the bosun's mates they never have a problem with that. You know, yeah, they, yeah. They, and that Jack's schoolmaster growing up never did either. That Jack's schoolmaster, who he calls old pagan. You know, had a nickname, Plagoso or Bilio, this uh, name because of the whipping there. And then he tells Fox, you know, you are no doubt a most capital diplomat, but you're a damned indifferent nursemaid. And and Fox is kind of, you know, chagrined a little bit. Yeah, he says, well, I, I never thought such things would enter their heads, said Fox sulkily. Public women, lewd girls. I'm sure they never entered mine at that age. And Jack and Stephen, the, the text says, just look down at their plates. So I, I think maybe we have another hint about Fox's sexuality here. <laughs> so, and, and certainly Jack and Stephen are not going to touch that comment here. Mm-hmm. Well, Fox, you know, excuses himself. He's got to leave for the palace. They wish him a very happy pilgrimage. And, and then Jack tells Stephen that he wishes that he could go with Stephen to Kumai, but that he really has to stay with the ship. But he does say, you know, let me ride with you to the crater wall. And then you tell me when you want to come back. And I'm going to have a couple of the Dianes bring a pony to meet you on the day that you return from Kumai. And, and we, we had a couple of references up in there. I don't know which of these are worth unpacking here. Well, I think it's worth quickly mentioning that Plagoso Orbilio is a reference to Orbilius Pupillus, a Latin first century BC grammarian. Uh, Plagosus is a word that describes a flogger, Orbilius, presumably here just corrupted by the bad memory of British schoolboys to Orbilio, is obviously something that sticks in the minds of English schoolboys, but they must have been incredibly well-read English schoolboys to have had some first century Latin grammarian as a, as a, you know, as a tag for somebody's nickname. Right. The, the, the righteous Sadducee is a really interesting remark to fling at Jack as well. Maybe we can dig into that. What do you think? Well, yeah, and this is Jack identifying as a righteous Sadducee. And, and Jesus is always talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these yeah. you know guys that have to follow the rules and do everything. Now, the fact that he picks the Sadducee is fascinating to me because the Sadducees were... You know, at, at the time, both of these guys were very high in the Jewish hierarchy, but the Sadducees were the aristocracy. They were the ones, you know, really the priestly element at the main temple. And, and they were the ones that didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead or the afterlife. They also believed only in the written law, kind of the Talmud, the first five books of the Old Testament. Yeah. None of the oral tradition, no interpretations, no context, you know, no, well, if this, then that. And, and we know Jack is, if he's anything, you know, he may be a bit of a Pharisee, even not quite that, a bit, he you know, certainly taught. But he is not a guy that is absolutely by the rules. He's humane and he's fair, and and so, um, you know, I I don't know, Ian. What do you what do you think? Well, but maybe maybe it's just a mistimed and misappropriated word. The, the Sadducees, as you mentioned, it were the ones who were sort of the aristocracy. Um, I think I'm right in remembering that they're the ones who went along with the Roman occupation. Oh yes, of, of, of Palestine. So right. m- maybe there's a connection there. The Sadducees being part of colonization. I don't know. Well, maybe, ah. maybe maybe it's just another another dodgy New Testament reference by uh, by a character in the story here. Right, right, right. So Mike, while Stephen's getting ready for his trip up the mountain and Fox is getting ready for his pilgrimage, maybe we should go and gird our loins um, to the tune of a, a cup of something refreshing. What do you say? Oh, I'd love that. Very good. We'll be right back after this short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. (music) 
welcome back. I hope you're ready for a voyage to the center of Patrick O'Brien's universe here. Yes. <laughs> Stephen and Jack and two Dyaks armed with spears. Dyaks uh, is the term for native uh, hunters and warriors in the Indonesian culture. You know, Dyaks were respected as you know, warriors and fighters armed with spears, traditional blowpipes, and chrises. Chrises, these wavy Malay daggers that are part ceremonial, but also pretty lethal. These Dayaks, who are part of the Sultan's bodyguard, assigned to the British mission, together with Jack and Stephen, make the long ride towards Kumai. This is this monastic settlement high up the volcanic peak of the island here. They go past rice farmers. They go past wildlife. And interestingly, Jack says he believes he sees a real snipe and touches his carbine. Now, Mike, there, there, there are two sets of references running here. Um, one is that a snipe is a game bird. And British people might be aware that if you go out hunting for pheasant, you might see a snipe and you might bag one. Um, I was talking to my friend Richard, who's shot a few birds in his time. He says, if you bag a snipe on a pheasant shoot, then that's good fortune and good mark marksmanship because they're small and they're agile and they're fast. So. To a, a British hunting person, snipe is just a badge of successful marksmanship. A snipe hunt, however, for other cultures is something different altogether, isn't it? It is. It is. I actually, in, in, in my youth, got initiated into a snipe hunt. I, I had heard of this luckily before, but I, I was living in inner city Baltimore. I moved to eastern North Carolina like all of a sudden, so to a, a county that had about half as many people as my high school did in Baltimore. Wow. And, yeah. And, and I was, you know, I was a real outsider because this is, we're back in the sixties and, you know, you're not from around here. And, yeah. um, but part of my initiation into the society was I was invited for a snipe hunt and a snipe hunt there means this kind of, it's, it's, it's a prank where you put somebody in the middle of the woods with a big bag and the people around are supposed to, you know, go off into the woods and make big noises and drive the snipe to you. And you, you keep the bag open and capture the thing. In fact, what they do is they leave you and they go back while you're standing in the woods in the middle of the night. But I knew about this. I didn't let on. So as soon as they left me and went off in the woods and started to pretend to make some noises, I dashed out, jumped into one of the awaiting pickup trucks and drove back to town. So that was, you know, it, it kind of changed my status as the newbie there in, in the local population. But and it's it's funny. I, I understand that that's a snipe hunt in the U.S. And I understand the French actually have a similar one, which is is around a mythical creature in in the, in the mountains. There, not a snipe, but a goat like mythical creature that you go right. hunting for in the same way. Gosh! And just to just to double check, the the moral of the story is you were you were fine with the in crowd from that point onwards, or they hated you forever. Well, you know, I'm not sure if this was the in crowd, but oh, okay. <laughs> it, it, was a, it, it was a crowd who actually admired the, the fact that I had, uh, had, had sort of come out of this thing okay. So it, it helped my status, certainly oh, in, in part of the local culture there. <laughs> Very good. Very good. And I'm sure they're all telling stories to this day about this guy, this out-of-towner. He was all across the whole snipe thing. Fantastic. Um, interestingly, I, I hadn't discovered this until you and I were talking about snipe and snipe hunting. The difficulty of hunting these birds gives rise to the military term sniper. So says Wikipedia anyway. You need to be an expert hunter, a really skilled marksman and skilled in using camouflage to bag a snipe. And that evolved into the term sniper, meaning a sharpshooter who can wow. take individual yeah. pot shots from a place of concealment. So snipers were originally going after a snipe. Well, and it's fascinating to me. It may be a completely innocuous reference, but I wonder if this double meaning isn't O'Brien setting us up for the story that's about to follow. Oh, this little tale here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ah. Good point. Yeah. Well, so we've got, we've got these Dayaks, these uh, native hunter, tracker, soldier, warriors, and we've got Stephen. And Stephen's way too involved in a discussion about Sago Palms with the Dayaks to notice this this deal with the snipe. Um, one Dayak knocks down several of these local unusual birds for Stephen. They use these very accurate blowpipes. The Dayaks eat these birds as part of their lunch. During the long journey, the walls of this huge crater are getting closer and closer. And remember, this is the first stage of the walk here when we've got Stephen and Jack and the, the escorting Dayaks. 
Jack complains that he's lost a stone through all the sweating here. Stephen says, well, you can well afford it, my friend. They finally reach a large durian grove just before the heathen temple and just before the start of the thousand steps path that goes up the crater wall to the monastery at Kumai. The temple here appears to be a desecrated Hindu holy place. And Mike, there's, there's a couple of interesting little side stories here about the history of religious culture in these islands because Hindu was the ancient religious culture and other religious cultures had come along and tried to sort of de deface and wipe out these figurative religious figures here in the Hindu temples. Yeah, there was even one, there was a, a local religious culture before the Hindus got there. Right. Okay. And, and, and yeah, so you've got this real progression here, hence the, you know, the gamelan that we talked about earlier, that was pre-Hindu. Yeah. yeah. So in this place, Stephen in particular is trying to, he, he sees this figure with uh, that's dancing with six arms and he tries to figure out what the name of it should be. And we'll come back to that in a second. Um, he spots, meanwhile, a reddish-brown shape in the leaves and calls out for Jack not to shoot. The first Dayak launches a dart, but there's this violent shaking in the tree branches and a heavily spiked durian shoots out between the heads of the two Dayaks who run off laughing. And this, this has been the first skirmish here between a full-grown adult jungle-living orangutan and these two Dayaks and their blowpipes. The orangutan heads off into the trees and we're left thinking, well, how is this all going to play out? Meanwhile, Mike, this this six-armed dancing figure, th this was really, really fascinating to think about what this might mean and what the connections might be to the culture of the islands. Yeah, I thought, you know, this is just such an obvious O'Brien Easter egg. It's got to be dead easy. And, and it wasn't for me. So anybody who knows Hindu gods better than us, which is probably most everybody, you know, <laughs> please, please jump in. But, you know, I, I, I felt like, you know, O'Brien was wanting us to look this up, that this was going to really tell us something. And then to let Stephen know, Stephen, well, here's the answer to your question. But I couldn't come up with a definitive answer. It appears that over time, Hindu art evolved and, and you've got so many different traditions and emphases and, and different stories about the same characters. But as this art evolved, this idea of adding multiple arms and, and at, at one point multiple heads to characters you know, was used to start to distinguish who's divine and who's human. Humans always have two arms or perhaps who's a god that's now taken on a human form, now yeah. gone from you know multiple arms to two arms. So uh, these possibilities include it's, it's at the very top of the pantheon, if you will, uh, Shiva. Shiva, Shiva, uh, in, in his kind of king of the dance and dancers, so Nataraja, and, and my apologies for our Indian <laughs> listeners here. I know I'm, I'm not saying this well at all here, but you see many times the dancing Shiva and, and has four arms, though, usually ah, mostly okay. four arms here. But this is such a fabulous reference that Fitzolf Capra used Shiva's dance to describe modern physics in the Tao of Physics, his, his book, a great book on you know, getting into all kinds of extended physics. Or Stephen, I think, would have appreciated that. But I'm also, you know, where I found a little bit more traction was Shiva's wife, Pravati, uh, you know, the daughter of the mountain. Mm -hmm. She can also be found dancing with multiple arms, especially in more of her kind of female goddess, mother goddess role. And as her manifestation uh, as as Kali, so that she has kind of this feminine energy in in the Hindu pantheon. And I'm, I'm you know I, I apologize you know for Hindu theologians. I know I'm not expressing this very well, but sounds great to it, me. All right, <laughs> but well, it's this idea that you know feminine energy is so vital to everything. It goes from the creation, the sustaining, and the destruction. Of everything, so Kali is is kind of the world destroyers, is fierce and everything, and so you can see all these manifestations with the multiple arms and dancing here. So this, you know, I, I like to think of O'Brien as appreciating kind of this nurturing, benevolent, but also fierce and destructive aspects of Pravate, this universal mother, but. You know, I know that you know, as soon as I was going to land on that, that even their son, Ganesh, who's, who's you know, Pravate's son with Shiva, multiple different stories about that, who, you know, was beheaded. His head was replaced with an elephant head. So Ganesh, who's one that some of my friends in India have sent home uh, 
you know, a replica for me of can be seen dancing with six arms at times, or at least can be seen with six arms. I'm not so sure that you see him dancing quite so much, but oh, fascinating wow. here. So O'Brien, you know, leading on quite the, uh, quite the fascinating tour of Hindu representations. Fantastic stuff. Really, really great. So Stephen's just at the beginning of the trek up the steps here. Um, he's under the durian trees and the Dayaks who are still there um, show him the droppings of the Mayas, the orangutan. There's a both uh, there's both a male and a female that have left their, their mark there. The four of them, Stephen and the Dayaks and Jack, eat durian together before they part so that Jack can get back before nightfall. Jack says that he thinks he saw someone, thought he saw a person climbing on the steps up to the monastery that Stephen is about to climb, but this person has disappeared. And as Jack reflects before he turns back, the steps appear to go on forever. And now, Mike, Stephen's on his own. We've got him and the steps and whatever and whoever is in the forest and in the landscape here with him. He climbs thinking about how much money he would have given to get a better look at that orangutan that had just fled. Meanwhile, as he's going along the climb, he sees more of these disfigured uh, statues of gods and uh, all the way through, he's counting the steps. And there are meant to be a thousand steps up here. At 300 steps, there's a beautiful new view out over the countryside. And Stephen sees another weary traveler. And at this point, Mike, we're all thinking like Jack, oh, there's, there's a person ahead of Stephen on the voyage here. A weary traveler in a shabby brown blanket, sometimes climbing on all fours where the steps are steep, far ahead. A little way further along, at 350 steps, the text says, Stephen tried to remember Pope's lines about the monument and the number of the tall bully's steps. I might, th this is an easy Easter egg. This is this is the London monument, not no, to London as, as simply the monument. It's the stone monument at the junction of Monument Street and Fish Street, just north of London Bridge in the, the city of London and in the business district of London. Um, so Christopher Wren built it in 1677 to commemorate London's fire of 1666 and really to also to celebrate the fact that the city was rebuilt. The monument is 202 feet tall, which is thought to be how far it was from the base of the monument to the original source of the fire. The crown on top of the monument has got gilded flames. There's an inscription that was originally there that blamed Roman Catholics for the fire. And here's where we get to Patrick O'Brien's nice little Easter egg. Um, Alexander Pope wrote a poem referring to this inscription when in 1733 he wrote, where London's column pointing at the skies like a tall bully lifts its head and lies. So well done, Mr. Pope. Well done for the fancy rhyming couplet. Well done for calling out the bigotry against Catholics. Uh, and well done for becoming a tag in a Patrick O'Brien novel. <laughs> anyway, in 1831, the Corporation of London removed the offending words by which time, of course, we were all much more open-minded than liberal. Oh, yes, in 19th century England. Right, right. And to answer Stephen's question, how many steps? This this tall bully, the tower, the monument of London, has uh, 311 steps. Yeah. Our special thanks to the website Hidden London for some of those great insights. Yeah, great stuff. Really nice. Well, you know, it's it's great. O'Brien keeps mentoring the religious zeal of all these people who are defacing you know, these statues and these gods and goddesses here, you know, as, as you mentioned, Ian, as different religions took over, they, you know, wanted to destroy what came from, some of them wanted to destroy what came before them. And at 400 steps, O'Brien writes that, they, you know, that that amount of climbing seems to have defeated the religious zeal of those, because now there's a shrine with complete figures, like, all right, I'm not going to climb it so high to express my displeasure here. And, and this shrine, 200 yards away from the steps there, is untouched by any violence. But this, this calm, detached figure at the shrine, the, the, the statue, has the other traveler resting beside it. And Stephen's looking over, and, and then he says, well, wait a minute, and, and he kind of can't believe it. And he fishes out his pocket telescope, and he confirms that the other traveler is, in fact, an orangutan, a Mayas here. Oh. Uh, now, you know, he's now like he's, you know, he just can't, he doesn't want to move. He doesn't know how well its you know, sense of smell is. He doesn't want to scare it off. And he's thinking, you know, I might not have a chance to see one of these again this close in a thousand years. Oh, so 
Yeah, you know, I'm I'm just loving this, Stephen. This is what he's been telling Van Buren. He would so dearly love to see, and here it is. You know, ha- not even yet halfway up these thousand steps at this shrine. Yeah. So yeah. You know, fabulous moment here. It's really great, and he's having this once in a thousand year moment. And he doesn't know what we're about to discover along with him, which is that there's there's more to come. Right. The ape, as it turns out, the ape that has very sore feet is making its way slowly up the steps. And Stephen's keeping a cable length, a cable distance, moving even more slowly, not wanting to get close, not wanting to spook the orangutan. At 600 steps, his calves and thighs are ready to burst. He pushes on until the ridge is close. As he turns the corner... The ape is right there in front of him, resting her feet. She's sitting on a stone. And he he was expecting to stay many, many dozens of paces back. And all of a sudden, he's right there. And he doesn't know what to think, doesn't know what to do. He says to her, in Irish, he says, God be with you, ape. (laughs) And she turns, O'Brien describes this as a sad, weary face, uh, looks him right in the eye. A falcon passes close overhead. And they both, Stephen and the orangutan together, watch it fly away. She's completely unmoved by this. She gets up and goes to walk on. As she walks away, Stephen studies the way her muscles move. He admires her wide shoulders. He admires the power of her arms. And she is clearly made to move through trees and not stairs. So it's even more incredible that she's making this journey, just like a human, up the steps here. Well, they they get to the ridge, and she turns again and looks at him and, and O'Brien says, you know, it's a happier, friendlier face, no longer kind of remote and removed. And, you know, Stephen's looking at her and then he looks and, and he's happy to see that at the top of this ridge, instead of these law, you know, another thousand steps down, there's this very gentle slope that, you know, the ridge is covered with trees. As he's looking out across, there's bamboo, there's grass covering um, and he notes that, you know, kind of the miles across the crater and this great lake in the middle. And as he looks around, he sees smoke wisping up from the Kumai Temple. And as he's looking at all this, the ape has gone ahead, has, you know, gone to the trees and is now up in the trees and, you know, really swinging quickly, making her way towards the monastery. Stephen sees that there's a very small path towards Kumai, uh, also going down this slope, and, and he starts walking it as the gong sounds from the monastery. He's getting simultaneously closer and closer with nature and also closer and closer to this great spiritual kind of high point of the journey here because he can hear the gong. When he arrives at the monastery, he hears remote chanting and sees a monk in an old saffron robe in the narthex. This is in the kind of entrance portico by a brazier. The monk greets him and offers him a cup of tea. And by the way, Mike, I, I love the similarity between the completely unfazed response to a stranger that both the monk has and the orangutan has. They're like, oh, you're here? Oh, okay. The monk offers him a cup of tea, of course. Um, Stephen's not a tea fan. In his own little interior dialogue that we're in on here, he describes it as an insipid wash, but he's thirsty, so and there's no coffee available, so he's pretty okay to go with the tea. He's grateful to, for it after the thousand steps. The Mayas, the orangutan, is sitting on the other side of the brazier, just as, as if this were part of the regular social interaction that goes on here in the monastery. The monk says to her, and this is where we get her name for the first time, Muong, where are your manners? And the ape rose high enough to bow. Stephen explains to the monk that he had come up the thousand steps along with Muong, the orangutan, And as they're talking, the ape watches their faces. When the monk asks if Stephen wants more tea, it's Muong who pulls the bowl from by her basket. Ananda, the monk, makes the tea, and the three of them sit there drinking tea together. Stephen starts to understand some of her, that's Muong's facial expressions, especially he notices the deep affection that is in her gaze as she's sitting looking at the monk. And Mike, it's not only Muong and the monk and Stephen, there's more living things and more connections here that we're starting to uncover. Yeah, as as darkness sets in, she's she's asleep. Mong is asleep, and and all of a sudden these gibbons start to hurry across the grass in front of this narthex. And Ananda, the monk, brings a lamp, and Stephen then sees that there's a mouse deer and her fawn standing there. And 
Ananda says he's sorry Muang has traveled so far. It's way too far for an orangutan of her age. Stephen says, well, you know, perhaps she was after the durians that grow down there. And, and Ananda says, no, no, they're closer durians. And he explains that she goes down there to see an old male orangutan. Unfortunately, the old male scorns her. And then she always comes back with her feet torn and her coat matted. And Stephen says, well, aren't there other orangutans close by? And, and he explains, it, yeah, there's many cousins close by, in, including other males. But she looks upon this male, the one down below, as her potential mate. Ah. Oh, there's, there's echoes of Stephen's fruitless pursuit of Diana. <laughs> right. Exactly right. Oh, I, I can't help it. I, I was wondering here, how did this orangutan become so much a part of this monastery, so much a part of human conversation and everything? And, and Ananda explains this to Stephen now. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. This is such a fantastical chapter. We're going to talk more about the fantastical attributes of it in a second. But the, the, there's an explanation coming. If we read on, Ananda tells the story of how they, in the monastery, the monks had found her as a suckling next to her mother who had probably died from a snake bite. They raised Muang on ewe's milk. And there's even this communication that she's learned. Uh, Muang can't speak but understands about 200 words follows ordinary conversations, is quiet and affectionate, has good manners. And as the moon rises, Ananda brings Stephen his dinner, his evening meal, and eats with him and asks where Stephen would like to sleep. There's an old pilgrim chamber, a floor up, but it's now filled with bats. And we get back to Muwong here. Stephen notices, having been offered the pilgrim chamber with the bats, Stephen notices that Muwong has spread a litter for herself to sleep in, here in the narthex, even though it exposes her to serpents and porcupines. And he says, well, if she doesn't dislike it, it'll do fine for me. And Mike, when we dig into this, the idea of some almost verbal communication between an orangutan and a human, turns out it's not so fanciful after all. No, no, it was fascinating to me. Um, you know, orangutans, it turns out, are excellent imitators. They communicate mm. extremely well non-verbally uh, that even it's almost like you know, when their handlers purposely pretend that they don't understand them or the researchers they'll change their gestures they'll use and invent new things to express what they mean kind of like we would do if we were playing a game of charades mm. and this communication ability is not just innate it's learned that researchers have found that orangutans learn new signs and ways of communicating from each other. They learn it from humans and, and even from other apes here. So they, they teach each other kind of how to talk to each other as well, again, non-verbally. But now, you know, in, in, in the not so recent past, they've found a great ape that is now known to, oh, well, and the orangutan is the only great ape that's ever been known to mimic, to or attempt to mimic human language, something that scientists thought was completely impossible. So, you know, maybe we can put something out on the socials. You know, BBC yeah. Earth had uh, you know a thing that, and it's just little sounds. It's not you know big big words and everything else, but it's an idea that they said no can't can't happen. But it's part of this imitation is now verbal, not just nonverbal. Incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah. And having got deeper into the connection between the orangutan and the humans of the monastery, we go deeper into connection now between Stephen and other things that are living here. He had known, I think, already that nothing in the Kumai crater had been killed by men since the beginning of the Buddhist era. And that's like 1 AD, I think, is where we look, how far we're looking back here. Despite that, he was still astonished by all the wildlife that he saw walking past him at night and coming to visit him. He describes it as half the ark. This is a beautiful description here in the text. Once in the night, he was woken by a huge, sweet-breathed creature blowing on his face. But by that time, the moon had set and he could not identify it. Then, in the early light, when first he raised his head, there was an orangutan nonchalantly leaving the narthex, where it had presumably called on Muang. And the dewy grass was crisscrossed with innumerable tracks. So this idea of Stephen needing to maintain dozens of paces separation from any other living thing, he's, he's realizing that he's not in that kind of place at all. Right. When he fully awoke, 
he saw that Mwang herself had gone. She'd neatly folded up her bedding. He's rubbing his uh, stiff legs and he took out the offerings that he had brought, offerings for the monks. Some tea and a particular kind of resin used to make incense. He heard the monks chanting, stop. And five choir monks and Ananda, the monk who was sitting with the previous day, and the abbot sat and had tea with Stephen. And Stephen presented his gifts. He described them as an unworthy offering to an ancient house, which is a very polite, deferential form of words. He told them an account of himself. He said, I'm a naval surgeon. I'm here because of the war between England and France. My second greatest interest after medicine is living things and their way of life. And he hoped to be able to study and measure and draw Kumai for a friend who was interested in the spread of Buddhism. He's talking about Fox here, of course. The abbot gives him permission and says, be aware, even so, that there's no killing here. There is no life taken. We eat only rice and fruit and such things. And Stephen says, that's fine. I'm not carrying any weapons. I'm just here to observe. And now it's the turn of the monks to dig in a little bit deeper as to why Stephen's here. Yeah, one, one monk asks Stephen if he's English. And Stephen explains, no, he's Irish, that, but that country is currently subject to England, hence, hence he's here. And the monk says, well, England and Ireland are just two small islands so close together, you know, over there in the, you know, way in the west in the ocean here, that it must be hard to tell any difference between them, that a, that a bird could land on one as easily as the other and, and have no idea where it was. <laughs> and, good way of putting yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. Stephen says that they are close and not always easy to distinguish from a great distance. But Stephen adds, that's also true of right and wrong. Oh, and I, oh man. And then the abbot says, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote the text here, good and evil are so close at times that there is scarcely the breath of a hair between them. Oh, <laughs> man. And so, you know, in the midst of all this fantastic stuff going on in this remote setting, Boy, here's this line that that O'Brien adds here. I think this is a brilliant insight and observation, and I can't help but think this has got to play out in this story. Yeah. Ah, oh, for sure. Uh, b- meanwhile, Stephen's still super passionate about exploring and understanding the local wildlife. N- now that he's convinced them that he's not carrying weapons, that all he wants to do is draw and measure, the abbot says, well, you're welcome. Go and explore the wildlife. Um, they do suggest that, first of all, he spends the first day taking the hot sulfur baths to ease the pains in his legs and his back from the walk up the steps, and that after that he can draw and measure the temple and be in better shape. Muwong can introduce him to her cousins, <laughs> a great little social, yeah, hang out with the orangutans, why not? Um, and he can go see gibbons and swine and medicinal plants. There are very few carnivores, it turns out, in Pulau Prabang. There are no tigers, there are no large cats, there are small cats, honey bears, and pythons that might go three months between meals. Like, that, that still wouldn't convince me to go up close to a python yeah. to measure it, but never mind. Right. Um, so the animals are mostly peaceful. They're not wary. They're not apprehensive. They haven't been hunted by man for a thousand years, so they're going to take no notice of Stephen. And it's this really idyllic sensation that we get from Stephen. We're, we're, all of this writing in the second half of the chapter is we're first person with Stephen in his point of view. And it's really easy to get swept along as he's in this paradise where he can walk freely through a herd of deer who are going to ignore him. He can feed the fawn of this tiny mouse deer and it, you know, it's perfectly happy to eat from his hand. There are birds that come to perch on him. And the text says the whole effect was very like being in a waking dream of losing human identity or even of being invisible as well as wonderfully supple and reposed after hours in the three basins, hollowed in the rock and fed by three faintly sulfurous springs, each hotter than the last. Oh, he's having yeah. a good day. He's having a really he's, good day. Yeah, I think he's absolutely revived body, mind and soul here. You know, this is this is just so incredible. Now, O'Brien, as we're getting sucked in, can't help but put a little bit of humor in here. It says the swine took a, as O'Brien writes, a curious, sometimes embarrassingly so, and playful interest in him. So I think any of us have gone up to some, you know, really, really uh, friendly animals who want to check us out. And we go, oh, 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 wait, wait, especially if we're doing it in company here. But O'Brien writes that the primates took an even greater interest and the orangutans took the most interest of all, even though they were mostly placid and solitary. 
Wong showed him his two sisters and they're young and they all came down. They touched his hair. They touched his clothes. They sat and looked into his face. Later, one enormous old male came down and sat with him, you know, just looking at him. And then when he gets ready to leave, he, he, you know, he just caresses Stephen's shoulder before going back up in the trees. And Stephen's watching and watching and watching, and he just really can't make out the orangutan's communication. You know, they, they make very few sounds. And, and that doesn't seem to Stephen to have a lot to do with their communication. And he's, he's wondering if perhaps it's not their eyes and small changes in expression. But he does know that Muang can, you know, always knows where they are, yeah. um, could yeah. invite them down from a long distance away. So he's wondering, you know, how does this all work here? So he's really relishing his time with this family of orangutans. He spends time studying the two sisters and their youngsters. But Mwang doesn't seem to approve it. <laughs> Another little reference back to Stephen and his attitude to family. Stephen thinks that she finds the children tiresome and the young mother's rather discreditable, even common. And it's a really lovely little human waspish kind of Jane Austen-ish insight on this family of, let's face it, orangutans. He makes a request to go and see them on his last day, a request repeated by Ananda. He got her to lead him there again. But Mawong immediately went back home alone. He's, she's like, you, you can hang out with these losers, but you know, I'm, I'm back to the monastery here. It's the only thing they'd really disagreed about. And Stephen stays there watching the children, these young orangutans, play. They've got boundless energy. He's mostly quiet as they attack and repel each other. They splash in the water. And then there's a fight. One child bites the other's ear, and the group shambles off together. That's not, though, the end of his observations for the day. He finds a new, discreet observation post and looks back to estimate the group's speed as they're travelling back through the forest. But his eye stopped along with his breath and his heart when he realised that what he thought was a grey boulder was actually a rhinoceros, a large male with one horn, standing about 17 or 16 hands. He cautiously takes out his spyglass. His hands are shaking. He's very cautious. And he watches as the rhinoceros raises its head and starts moving fast straight up the hill. Mike, this is a real moment to end the chapter on. <laughs> right. So, you know, let's just let's just use O'Brien's word. And as he watched, Stephen understood his reputation for shocking strength and savagery, disemboweling elephants, devastating thorn breaks for hours on end out of mere blind fury and malignance, tossing bulls as though they were footballs. The speed increased, the thick short legs fairly twinkled as the creature ran gathering impetus and then stephen sees another rhinoceros at the top of the slope which is also running at the same great pace and the two of them kind of slam their shoulders right into each other they come down sort of turning land next to each other and both of them head straight for stephen the ground trembled shockingly stephen leapt to his feet and then with a great trampling, rushing din, they were past, racing towards the lake. Within a yard of its edge, they wheeled together, wheeled as quick as boars, and raced up the hill again, shoulder to shoulder, their hooves twinkling in time as they crossed the ridge and disappeared. End of chapter seven. <laughs> yeah, end of chapter seven. I, I don't know that I did that justice, but I remember my heart just like, yeah. boom, 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 yeah. peaceful, yeah. Placid Valley, everybody gets along. We all love each other. Two rhinoceroses head yeah. straight for Stephen. Here we go. Man. Oh, what a chapter. Yeah. I mean, it, it just seems like to me, my immediate reaction when I put this thing down again was this is a slice of O'Brien that, that I don't think we've really seen before. Certainly not to this degree. No. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's been he's quite enjoyed sort of personifying animals when they come along in the story, but th this idea of humanizing animals, or maybe even animalizing humans, and it, getting really really close to this completely naturalistic interaction between Stephen and the animal kingdom, I think it's something that feels like it's it's a big emotional slice of Patrick O'Brien thinking for himself and about himself. Right, and, and you know, all of this in the context of you know old Hindu shrines in, you know, in a Muslim country on the way to a Buddhist monastery in the midst yeah. of a natural paradise enclosed by a high volcanic wall. I mean, this is, 
you know, he has really built this incredible world here and uh, all of the thing. And, and, and Stephen's relationship with Muang, I, you know, I don't think I've ever seen Stephen with that close an animal relationship. I mean, this is, you know, the sloth was a great drinking buddy of Jack's, but I don't think <laughs> Stephen and, and the sloth were anywhere near as close as Stephen and, and Muang here. Oh, and also, it strikes me that I really remember this chapter and I really anticipated getting here is that it was the thing that I was looking forward to for the previous six chapters. And actually, when you look at it, this chapter doesn't do very much for character, doesn't do very much for story. Earlier on, we had a couple of bits of spy back and forth, but they were very kind of, yeah, OK, we're done. So this of all the brilliant, brilliant chapters in O'Brien, this is one of the most memorable. It's the least story relevant of all. But I think it's absolutely Patrick O'Brien relevant. This is him writing about himself, and we get right into his his view of the world here. What his what his, his what his fantasies and his wish fulfillment would look like. Well, you know, and you and I were discussing this, and you know, I was admiring, you know, how many of the things that O'Brien got right here yeah. in the midst of what seems just like a completely fanciful chapter. I was also taken by this idea that there's only a hair's breadth between good and evil. I thought, oh, boom, Christ. okay, here, you know, we absolutely put a plot point here. But then we, you know, I was asking the question about, you know, how does O'Brien back in the day learn about all this stuff and everything yeah. else? And you were you were kind of digging into how O'Brien does his research and came up on a fascinating thing about this chapter, I thought. Yeah, thank you. I mean, of, of the many things that we dip into from time to time, sometimes we dip into Dean King's book, Patrick O'Brien, A Life Remembered, a, a book that the O'Brien family didn't take very kindly to. And we learn very little about how O'Brien might have learned about natural history and Eastern philosophy. Um, but we do learn about the editor's reception to this particular passage in 13 Gun Salute. So O'Brien's editor, Richard Ollard, thought that this particular moment in Kumai stretched the limits of credibility. I'm quoting more or less directly from Dean King's book here. But for all it stretched the credibility, and he, he's comparing it in his mind with the, the bear suit episode in uh, Post Captain, he thought that this was fanciful and also didn't have the redeeming feature of being integral to the plot in the way that the bear costume is. And to Ollard, it looked clearly like it was just O'Brien's fancy and Dean King writes that the editor, Ollard, might have been tempted to invoke the advice of Samuel Johnson's college tutor, who allegedly said, whenever you meet with a passage which you think is particularly fine, you should strike it out. So this might have ended up on the cutting room floor if Ollard had persuaded O'Brien to take that advice. Instead, Ollard soft-pedaled it a little bit. He simply suggested that perhaps the scene was structurally out of place, where falls in the story and what role it plays. And O'Brien completely shrugged off the advice. The scene was dear to his heart, we learn. Mary had approved it, and that was the end of the conversation. The scene was a bit self-indulgent, but then, for all intents and purposes, and still I'm quoting directly from Dean King here, for all intents and purposes, as O'Brien had shown with testimonies, after he had written a book and incorporated Mary's suggestions, he listened only ever to one critic, and that's himself. While his occasional flights of fancy did stand apart from the rest of his writing, says Dean King, while they were, they were entertaining, they were also useful in undercutting the tendency of readers and critics to become prepossessed with the book's high degree of historical accuracy. And Mike, I'm 100% with Dean King here. We, we need these bits of magical realism, if, even if it turns out that they're a little more realistic and a little bit less magical than we first think these are these are part of the poetry of patrick o'brien and if you insist on everything being correct you know down to the last beckett and the last marlin spike then you're missing something of of his intention and the value of what he wrote right right yeah well you know it, it, it was a fabulous break in the action e even yeah. if it had no structural point but i think it did i yeah. think there was yeah. some stuff in there i love that thought planning in the middle of it and I can't wait to see how all this plays out, or if it plays out, as we return to the Sultan and Abdul and Ledward and Ray and Fox and, and the rest of our cast of characters. And when negotiations resume, I don't know. What do you think? Perhaps in the next chapter? I, I, I don't know, Mike. Who, who, who's going to get stripped to the bones by red ants we, right. there's only one way to find out perhaps we should um, reach down the book one more time what do you say next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien 
Oh, I would like that of all things. do something oh i was just going to tell mosey to be quiet <laughs> go ahead if you need to or is he now right. quieting down again well hush good dog all right sorry sam <laughs> there, there you go there's an outtake